Hey there. Are you thinking about starting or expanding an e-commerce business? Are you looking to uh, find a product to sell? Well, good. You are in the right spot. My name is Kevin and I'm from MaximizingEcommerce.com. I help people start and grow e-commerce businesses. And in this video, we're going to walk through what to look for when you're sourcing a product to sell. Um, we're going to use Amazon as an example and we're going to talk through what are some of the rules, so to speak, of what you should look for when you're uh, sourcing for a product. But at the same time, too, I want to walk through also the why. Why you would look for things that meet certain criteria. Um, because at the end of the day, the best thing to do is to break some of the rules. Because if you do everything that everyone says to do, so everyone's zigging, uh, you're going to get the same results that they're all getting as they're zigging. So as they're zigging, you want to zag a little bit. But at the same time, too, you don't want to completely go off the rails and do something um, that doesn't meet the fundamentals. So, again, we're going to talk through what is working timelessly, what is kind of the strategy and the why behind it. So let's go ahead and get into that. So the statement I really want to walk through, sorry about that there a little bit, um, is find a product to sell that people want to buy that you can sell for a profit. Let me repeat that because you're probably thinking, well, that sounds so incredibly simple. Um, that just sounds like what you would do anyway if you're looking to sell something. Yes, it is. And it is that simple. So if you put yourself in that mindset of find product to sell that people want to buy that you can sell for a profit, it puts all the other little rules and check, so to speak, so that you can decide, okay, is that a rule I have to follow? Um, and if not, does it still allow me to meet the main objective, which is to find a product to sell that people want to buy that you can sell for a profit? It is that simple. Now, again, we're going to go through some strategies and tactics here in a moment um, on the selling part. And depending on when you're watching this, uh, we're also going to next week uh, have a video um, where we're going to walk through more of the, uh, how to source a product. But right now we're going to look for what the, the, the product is you want to buy. So first off, you want to find a product that people want to buy that you can sell for profit. I know I keep repeating that, but I want to make sure that that sticks in and really like, okay, that that's the whole crux of everything because, uh, we're going to unpack that here. So find product that, to sell. So you have to have a product identified and then you have to have a product that you can source. And again, um, in another video, we're going to talk through the sourcing part of it. Um, and that people want to buy. So the key is that people are going to want to buy a product. If you don't have a market to sell to, you're just pretending to be in business. So you don't want to just pretend to be in business. You want to actually be in business and have a product that people want to buy. Because if it's a product no one's ever heard of, or if it's something that just there's really no demand for, then you're not going to sell much of it. So, um, and then you want to be able to sell it for a profit. So part of being able to sell it for a profit is not having too much competition, uh, making sure the margins are there. So we're going to walk through a little bit more of the specifics on what to look for. So let's backtrack for a second here and talk about what are the basics of the cash flow when you make a sale in e-commerce. So I'm going to use Amazon is an example because it's the easiest to start with. And if you've not started before, um, somewhere in the description, whether you're watching on Facebook or Facebook or YouTube, I might have my arrows or mixed up. Um, but anyway, I'm going to have a link for you to go to where you can uh, download a free cheat sheet on how to make your first sale, um, which would be something I call retail arbitrage. Um, and I've got a couple other videos uh, explaining how to do that as well. But in this video, we're going to talk more through just the basics of selling on Amazon and then um, the products we're going to, again, talk about sourcing. It'll be more on the private label side where you're buying in more quantities, but you first got to make that first sale. Highly important to make that first sale just so it can be real for you in your brain that this is something that you can do. So the first thing is in e-commerce, you're looking for a product that you're going to buy. So you have to buy something on the front end and that's your cost of goods sold. Um, that is the cost of the product. So what you're paying for it. So you got to account for that. Then what you're going to do is you're going to sell it at some price and we'll go through some different price points to really think about. Um, and then you are going to have a fulfillment fee. The fulfillment fee is going to be based on weight, but let's just say if it's less than a pound, it's probably going to be two ninety nine on Amazon. That could change if you're in the holidays, it could be less than that. They might raise it another time. So depending on when you're watching it, let's just say $3, um, for something less than a pound, but it doesn't have to be less than a pound. 
then you're going to have a commission. So let's say on Amazon, your commission, um, it's going to depend on the category, but for most products you might sell, it's probably going to be about 15%. And it's going to be a minimum of a dollar. So you wouldn't want to sell something that's only $4 because $1 that is going to commission as opposed to 15%, which would only be, in that case, 60 cents. You're paying an extra 40 cents in commission. So you want to make sure that the price is high enough to at least justify the minimum amounts of commission they're going to charge you. So, um, so then you're going to subtract out your cost of goods sold, and then what you're left over is your margins, which could be either profit, uh, something you might pay for marketing or something along those lines. Um, but just to keep it simple, we're going to focus on the three buckets of uh, cost of goods sold, um, whatever you pay to Amazon uh, for commission and fulfillment fees, and then whatever's left over for margins. Now, a rule of thumb, and this is just a, a friendly rule of thumb. It doesn't have to be exactly this, but a lot of times people talk about a third, a third, a third uh, for if you Think about it, you know, a third going to cost of goods, a third going to the um, fulfillment fee and commission combined, and then the third that's left over, which is your margins. So if you're able to work that out, if you think about that, you're putting a dollar in, for every dollar in, you're getting a dollar out, or sorry, you're getting actually $2 out, so you're getting a dollar profit, because um, you paid for that on the front end. So think that in the back of your mind that, okay, anything you do that might have higher costs, whether it be higher percentages for, you know, fulfillment fees or for the uh, commission, that's going to come out of your margin. So you're going to have a smaller margin. If you have smaller uh, fulfillment fees, then you're going to have a bigger margin. Um, if you're paying more or less for cost of goods, that's going to either build your margin or take away from it. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through what these different um, criteria are that you're looking for a product. So you're going to look for a product, I would say, in the range of $15 to $50. And um, you might be saying, well, but you know, if I go for something that's more expensive, the, it's probably going to end up being more expensive. And that's 100% true, typically. Now, let's say you're doing a test run and you talk the supplier into uh, doing 200 units, then you're paying $6 a piece and you're going to sell them for $20. So that's probably a good thing to shoot for if you're looking to sell a product $20 range that you're going to hopefully get it for $6, not just the price of the product, but actually delivered um, and landed cost, they, they like to say. Uh, but if you sell a product for $40, and let's say you get 100 units and... You, you buy them for $12 each, including your cost to ship, then it's the same thing as what you're really spending the money on. You're just, you're just dividing it up a little bit differently. So hopefully that makes sense. So either way, you'd be in both my scenarios there that are hypothetical, it'd be $1,200 that you'd be putting in and hopefully getting, even after some of your other expenses, about $1,200 back. So you'd be getting about the same amount of money back, um, assuming you, got, you sold through all your inventory. Um, so think of it as you have a pool of money and then for that pool of money they're putting in, what are you getting out? So a lot of that is the price, which is that top line and sales of what you're, you're getting. So generally speaking, you want to go in the range of 15 to $50. I have products that are under that, that actually do pretty well. So these aren't hard and fast rules. So again, like I said earlier, if you do what everyone else is doing, you're going to get everyone else's results, which sometimes aren't always good. But if you switch it up a little bit, that's where the ones that are successful do. They find some way to differentiate themselves. Um, generally speaking, you want your product to be less than two pounds just because the as the weight increases, so if you got something that's heavy, like you wouldn't want to sell marble balls. Well, maybe you would if you can get the, um, the margins right and get a high selling price to justify the fact that it's gonna be a lot in fulfillment fees and a lot to get it here. Um, so your cost of goods sold is going to be expensive for shipping uh, to get it here in the States or wherever you are. Um, but generally speaking, you want something light. I try to keep things generally under a pound, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Again, if you can make the margins work for you, you can break the rules because the timeless principle part is that you can sell at a profit. Um, 
Now, part of that is if you can get it to fit in a shoebox. So if you can get whatever that product is to fit in a shoebox, from an Amazon standpoint, it's a standard size item and it's not oversized. So as it goes oversized, your fulfillment fee gets larger. So fulfillment fee starts cutting into some of those margins. So you wanna make sure that it's able to fit into a shoebox. But again, these, is, I'm kind of going back and forth here, but it's about making sure that you are able to make a profit. That's, that's what you really are all about. Um, avoid something in electronics or something with a lot of moving parts, especially when you're first starting out. So you wouldn't want to do like a mechanical clock or a Bluetooth or something along those lines. Now, I'm a fan of as you've been doing this a little bit longer, you can start playing with complexity a little bit more, but especially if you're first starting out and this is your first product, or your first couple of products, I would avoid anything that's gonna be a little bit more complex, something that's gonna have more support issues from customers, uh, potentially more returns. Um, electronics is notorious for um, having a lot of returns. Um, the margins tend to be kind of small because it's a little bit more commoditized. Um, so I would avoid something electronics or something with a lot of moving parts, especially when you're starting out. Now, it doesn't mean that that can't be something you shoot for later, though. Um, make sure that it's a, in a category that you can sell in. So, for example, um, you can sell in like home and garden uh, pretty easily, but there are some gated categories like health and beauty. So um, you would want to avoid maybe like health and beauty or supplements or something along those lines. But that doesn't necessarily mean that later on down the road, that would be a bad thing to do. But for starting, again, some of it is complexity. So as much as it's about margins, and we haven't really touched on complexity, but when you're first starting out, you want it to be relatively simple, but not so simple that it's easy for everyone else to copy you. Um, and so that kind of touches into my next point of you want to have something that you can differentiate a little bit. Now, Sometimes people get too worked up on this one that, you know, they want everything to be perfect and they start paying for all these molds and whatnot. Whatever your first product is, especially if it's your first product or if it's your first run at a product, it's better to see if you can negotiate smaller quantities from a supplier and reiterate it from then on. So like, for example, my first product, I did 200 units of it. And since then, I have um, made at least four different changes to that product just to um, make some sort of uh, improvement, generally speaking, based on customer feedback. Because I know personally, when I first started out, I kept coming up with all these different excuses in my head why this product wasn't going to work and all this. And most of those things weren't even an issue. And there were other things that people brought up that I didn't even think about with that product until... I actually got feedback from real people to hear what they actually did care about and what was just head trash in my mind of things that really didn't matter. So it's all about finding somewhat to differentiate, but don't worry too much about making it perfect. That's a mistake I see a lot of people making is that at the end of the day, if you don't pull the trigger, so to speak, and actually buy that product, send money off to China or to Nebraska or wherever people are making their product, if you don't pay for the product and get product in, you will never make a sale, um, especially in that private label type business. So I would also avoid too much competition, but you want some competition. Some competition is a good thing. So if you're going into something, you're like, oh, I can be, the, there's no one else selling this. I can sell whatever this new widget is, it's the best, next best thing. That might be the case, but generally speaking, new products, um, especially if it's serving a new market or fixing a new problem, um, has to have people know what they're looking for. Because people go onto Amazon and they look for, I want this particular product because it's scratching an itch, it's fulfilling a need, it solves a problem, it, raises their status, something, but it's something that they're looking for. And they're kind of at least have a general idea, maybe not that exact product they're buying, but they know what type of product they need. So if you have a product that no one else is selling, that's usually a bad thing. So you, if you think of it this way, if some people are selling it, that's great. Now, you may be thinking like, okay, well, what does that mean? Some people are selling it, but not too much. So sometimes I use the example of French press coffee maker. It's that, you know, it's kind of like a, a pitcher, so to speak, generally glass or like a hard plastic that, you know, you pour hot water in and then you push the little lever down and it makes the coffee. 
if you look on Amazon, that's a very competitive product. So if you look on the first page for the main keyword, um, like French press coffee maker, um, and all of them have like, I think like for that particular product around a thousand, some of them, several thousand reviews, that's going to be hard to compete with starting out. Um, not to say that that's not a product that you can't sell down the road or start finding a niche within that, but that's really hard and complex, especially if you're first starting out. So I would avoid a product like that. Now, if you see a product and you put it in the main keyword of it, when I say main keyword, I mean like French press or coffee maker or something like that, or as opposed to like black handled French press coffee maker or chrome topped French press or something like that. So now it's getting a little bit more specific. So there's fewer people looking for that, um, that type of product. So it's not quite as indicative as when you're looking at the main, we'll call it the seed keyword, which in that case would be French press coffee maker or French press. So that particular product is going to have a lot of people that are getting it. And some other, um, types of examples might be, and these are some that are kind of cliche in the private label world, like yoga mat, garlic press, uh, barbecue gloves. If it's something that just seems like, oh yeah, that's like the perfect type of product to do. Cause it's something that people don't have a lot of brand affiliation for. Um, cause there's not like a main brand competitor for it. Then, well, maybe it's, um, a good product to sell. But if it has a lot of competition where there's private label sellers that are selling, you know, 50 a day and they all have at least a thousand reviews, that's probably not the right one to start with. Now, again, you can break the rules, but it goes back to product that you can sell. Now, product you can sell, some has to do with your experience, your risk tolerance, and how much um, money you have to invest on the front end. Because you might have to buy a lot of product and give away a lot of product and discount a lot of product just to start getting sales. Um, just to get it kind of even noticed, so to speak, so on the radar. Whereas, if you find a product that doesn't have a lot of... Um, competition, but there is some competition. So you can see that there's history that people are actually actively looking for this product. Then what you're going to do is start saying, okay, does this make sense? So you might see, you know, maybe the top competitor has like 300 reviews. Another one has a hundred reviews, but there's ones on the first page that maybe have like 10, 20, 30. That's probably a good one to go for. Because when I talk about the reviews, it all comes down to think about, put yourself in the customer shoe. So if you're the customer and you're, you're just typing away saying, I want to buy a certain type of product and you're looking to see all the different, um, uh, products that are available. Now y y there's the, what we're going to call social proof, the element of what are other people doing? What are other people buying? So if other people are buying a product and it is, um, you know, got, you know, a thousand reviews and four and a half stars, or there's another product that has four and a half stars and it's got four reviews. Which one are you more likely to buy? Most likely it's going to be the, especially if everything else is equal, looks like around the same quality, um, price is good. You're probably going to say, well, more people are buying this one based on the fact there's more reviews. So you know at least a thousand people bought it. Now, if you've been in this business for a while, you probably know a thousand reviews is probably like 50 to 100,000 sales because only a small percentage of people actually leave a review. But that's another story. Um, so you want to go after something where there's not quite that many reviews. So if people are comparing and let's say, you know, you've got two, three reviews after, you know, maybe a couple months of being on there, and, you know, people are looking at it like, this looks fine. And I'm comparing it to another one here on the first page. It's got 15 reviews and another one maybe has 20 or 30. Um, people will buy it. And, you know, reviews, sometimes people get too caught up in reviews. I, I think reviews just tells whoever it is that's deciding whether or not to buy when they're making the decision whether or not to um, hit the little add to cart button and then pay for it. Um, that's going through their mind is, am I going to like this? Because they can't touch it, hold it, 
feel it like they can in a store, but they can look and see, well, what do other people think? And a lot of people online think, well, what do other people think? So if it's a product that other people seem to like, then people think that, well, it's probably a product that's good for me as the consumer. So they're more likely to buy it. But sometimes people don't even pay any attention to that at all. It just looks like something they want to buy. The photos look good. Great. The copy and the description looks great. Great. Buy it. So you'll still make some sales potentially, but, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of reviews, but the more reviews you get, the easier it gets is really what I should say. So reviews help you convert. So for every person that goes on the page, you get theoretically a higher percentage that are buying if there's more social proof. Now you're going to have less people clicking on the link if there's everything else around it, even if you're paying paid ads and people see, you know, this one's got 2000 reviews. This one has a thousand reviews. This one has 900 reviews and yours doesn't have any, or it has one cause you just started. Um, that's not an too much of a hurdle in some situations, but if it's, you know, they're looking and they see that one is 50, one is 30, one has 10, and there's still products out there that fit that bill. Now, maybe the, the best of the best don't sell 50 to hundred a day. Maybe they sell four or five a day. That's actually a win. If you can just sell a few a day and start making profit and take that profit and reinvest it over time, you're going to have a really good business. So it all comes back to, can you get people to sell it? And, um, is it something you can hopefully get at a, a smaller amount? So just to reiterate, I know I threw a lot out there. Um, you know, is the meet a good price point? Let's say 15 to $50 could be higher, could be lower. It just depends on your comfort level. As you start getting into higher price products, you've got to pay more for each product. Um, hopefully less than two pounds as it gets heavier, you pay more. Um, you can go on Amazon and they'll walk you through what their fees are. Um, the, hopefully it fits into a shoe box, but then again, you know, if it doesn't fit into a shoe box and it's larger and you have to pay more for fulfillment fees cause it's oversized. Great. Maybe it's something that you can, um, still work out the details of, uh, how that particular product is going to, um, to work, you know, how the margins will work. So then what you want to do is, um, you know, make sure it's in a category you can sell in, that it's not something that's too complex like electronics or something with a lot of moving parts, uh, especially when you're first starting out. And you want to be able to have some way of differentiating it. The days of being able to just throw on a barbecue glove are over, um, but there's still lots of great opportunities out there. So again, don't worry about it being too perfect, especially in the beginning, just start. So for me, again, I made changes after, you know, four or five different orders. I started with 200. My first order, I usually order 500 for my first product that I'm still selling almost two years later. Um, and you know, if it doesn't work, so be it. Think of how much you're going to learn out of the deal. If you at least get in, because there's too many people and I see it all the time that, you know, six months later, a year later, they're still searching. They're still looking. It's, not that hard. Even if it takes, if put it this way, the person that spends a year thinking about it and trying to find that right, perfect product. And the person who let's say they put a little bit of money into this, it doesn't sell as well as they had hoped, but they sell through whatever they bought in a year. Who's ahead in that year. And let's say the person that sold, they only got their money back, which is not too hard. Um, you know, there's no, guarantees, but let's say they get their money back in a year. Who's better off the person that got their money back after a year of trying or the person who is continuing to research and find the perfect product. I'm going to challenge you to think it's the person who got in the game, who started playing, who said, I'm going to figure this out because that person is going to know a whole lot more. It's going to make more sense. It's not just hypothetical, um, you know, reading blog posts, watching Facebook lives, YouTube videos, webinars, whatever people talking about what to look for. They have a better eye of what to look for. Cause now it makes more sense cause they were in the game. Um, and then maybe they can even make the product better and start selling it more and more over time as that product gets history with Amazon and the algorithms are probably going to be a little bit more friendly to it. So hopefully you found this video helpful. So depending on when you're watching this, if you're watching this live or within about a week of when this video comes out, uh, the following week, 
on Thursday at 9.30 Eastern Time. We'll have a, another Facebook Live where we're going to talk about sourcing from Chinese suppliers, um, which you don't necessarily have to source from Chinese suppliers, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about would work with any type of suppliers, but um, sometimes it can be intimidating you know, dealing with someone in another country. However, I will tell you, they want to work with you probably more than you even want to work with them. So as long as it's a good you know, working relationship. Uh, I found Chinese suppliers to be actually a lot more trustworthy than I had thought. So we'll talk about that next week. And if you're watching this in the recording, maybe even in, around here, I'll have a link um, so that you can see that video as well. So uh, if you have not already, please give us a thumbs up. Um, either on the, the video or subscribe to the channel or to the Facebook page so we can make sure to let you know when we have more videos like this that come out. And more than anything, I just want to thank you for making it all the way here to the end. And I wish you the best as you work on your e-commerce journey. Take care.